<laughs> That's right. This week, guys, a little spoiler for you. You know, um, Steve's going to be talking about Gideon today. And, you know, as I was working through, what, Lord, what songs should we be singing this week? And I thought about songs of surrender, you know, because Gideon was so resistant um, to God's, God's call for him. 
And I think um, surrender comes also when we recognize who the Lord is. So we're going to sing a a newer song for us um, just as a reminder of who our God is um, as we just bring our hearts before him. the world Nothing. 
When I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, glad to be called a child of God, and I am in recovery for codependency, and my name is Joni. But Celebrate Recovery is a safe place to do that. It's a hospital for sinners, and Celebrate Recovery is the intensive care unit. easy. Taking off that mask is very hard. But Celebrate Recovery is a safe place to do that. So we have a boss, you guys. <laughs> um, we we've, we've been praying about it when we found out that the school does you know auctions when they're getting rid of buses, and we touched base with them, and they said, "Yep, they're going to auction um, in June." And so we <laughs> I was at the computer bidding, 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 um, and yeah, money. Um, and then we're going to be doing some fundraising to pay for that bus. But we are so so excited. Um, to be able to have this bus to take students um, to ice camp and to rodeos and all sorts of things to learn to love Jesus more and um, and then to use it for service projects so our kids can serve the community as well. So we're just really excited and um, we'll kind of let you guys know what it's going to look like for fundraising and we would love for you guys to come alongside us. So thanks. The, um, the bus was 150000 right? 
It was actually more in the less than 3,000. Um, so anyhow, it's one of those things that's really going to be very, very, very helpful as we're dealing with the um, transporting of kids, which is always an issue for ice camp and everything. While Sarah is coming, uh, I want to mention that when it comes to the community service in a couple of weeks, one of the guys who's going to be speaking is a guy named Darren Hanel. One of our homeboys is going to be a speaker. So we encourage you to be here and be a part of that. Hi. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, this week, as you saw the video, we had our school's out party, and the kids just had a ball. They were loving it. The teenagers were loving it. The parents were loving it. Everybody. We had a music lady that was kind of emceeing the whole event, and um, balloon animals, and the line just went on for what seemed like miles, and, and they thankfully stayed a little extra so we could make sure to get every kid a balloon animal, and so that was fantastic. And then we had um, a COVID-style dunk tank, which you saw in the video, and that was a hit. And so it was, I went, a, my husband was awesome in making that for me. Um, but um, with all the prayers and the volunteers and the donations, it was just the greatest first event. <laughs> that I, and I'm so excited excited and um it was really cool to see how god um he uh was definitely there he he calmed my nerves that's for sure um and he just showed up big and um big things happened so i'm excited to see um it kind of pushes into vbs this this summer and um we're we're really thrilled to see how um we can serve the children uh, then So, as this humble young lady said, school's art party was fantastic. So, um, I just want to thank you. It was, you know, yes, don't be nervous. It's okay. Um, I got a little guy that was there, and... He just ranted and raved and couldn't say enough (laughs) wonderful things about it. And Dustin, dunk tank. Beautiful. Great great job. Um, So I would like to say a little prayer for you and your ministry. Thank you. Okay. So here we go. Father, we just come before you and we give you thanks. We give you thanks for Sarah and the wonderful gifts that you've given to her. The creativity... And just the love that she has for the kids. So, Father, we ask that you bless her, that you continue to bless her. Bless her and her family, her increasing family. (laughs) So, Father, just thank you. We ask that you be with her and guide her and let her continue to be your hands and feet. Because all the glory is for you. Amen. Amen. Thank Thank you. you. So, another hat, this one. Um, So, as you know, we've been trudging through. What you need open, close the doors that we shouldn't go through. And that's what's been happening. So, thank you. Okay? He's got a plan. We've got uh, several more uh, candidates that we're looking at this week. Uh, Hopefully, um, we can do a couple more interviews this week. So, please be patient. It's hard for me. I want to be done with this. But um, it is what it is. Um, We keep plugging through. Um, Guys keep contacting us. We keep reaching out. So um, when the right one is, the right one will be. And then we'll have to say goodbye to Steve, which will be another sad day. But that's where we're at. Um, Same story, just different week. So uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your plan. Lord, we know that your plan is much better than ours. And the man that you have is going to be the right guy. So, Lord, we ask that he takes care of business on his end. We take business care on our end. And it's all your business. So, Father, we ask that we get that done soon. 
we continue to ask that you close the doors that we're not supposed to go through. And let us walk through the door that is wide open. So we ask you to bless the committee, give them ears to hear in your heart, in your son's name. Amen. In a few minutes, I'll be talking about Gideon. And um, right now, we're going to deal with communion. And you don't normally think of communion with chapter 8, verses 33 through 35. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals, or Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their god, and they did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerub Baal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. God knows that we have short memories. We forget things so quickly. I brought a friend along this morning. Is that Mario? <laughs> Not sure who it is. All I know is that when I was at the University of Chicago Museum of Oriental History, and you're going, huh? It has all sorts of biblical history stuff in it. And also when I was in Israel and Egypt, they have displays of Baals or Baals. This is about the size of most of the gods that it talks about them worshiping. Little metal idols, kind of like little green army men. Here we have the story of Gideon and all that he does with conquering the Midianites. And the moment he dies, they turn back to worshiping things like this. How crazy must people be to do that? It says, the moment that he died, they did not remember what God had done. You know, the Great Commission, Jesus said, I'm leaving as I go, as you, because he knew that we would really remember very well. But what happened is then, most believers have forgotten that we're supposed to fulfill the Great Commission because we forget and we chase after all sorts of things that are way less important. In order to help us to remember the message we carry, God gave us a couple things. One of the things he gave us was communion. So that every time we eat and drink communion, we're reminded about the incredible sacrifice Jesus gave in allowing his body to be beaten and put on the cross. And we're reminded every time we drink the cup that we have within us the grace of God because you see, when Jesus held up the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, it ushered in the era of grace. And every time we take communion, we are reminded about the grace of God that washes away our sins, even as the devil within and the devil, well, the devil is not within if you're a believer, even, even though the devil will use every method possible to try to accuse us and make us feel guilty and make us feel shame. God gave us the reminder of communion to remember that Jesus died for us and by his shed blood we stand forgiven. We have the elements here and of course the elements are a little different during this era because we have the cup that has both together so the there's nothing in this that saves you. It is the blood of Christ that saves you, 
represented by what is here. I'm going to invite you this morning, as we're led in a song, you're welcome to sing or just listen. I'm going to invite you to come and get the elements. And if you want to spend time up here at the altar or if you want to go back, remember what you've been forgiven from. If you can't think of anything you needed forgiveness for, ask the person who's with you. They'll be glad to fill you in on a few. Okay? But I think all of us are well enough aware of our sin. So come, and if you want to celebrate the grace here or back in your seats, that's up to you. If there are any that are physically unable or for whatever reason would choose to have someone else come and get the elements for them, just ask. They're not going to say, no, I'm not doing that for you. If they say that, just pray for them. Find somebody else, okay? If you get up here and the top tray is empty, move that tray to the side. There's more underneath here. We're big kids here, right? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace because you know more than anybody else how much grace I need. And it is because of that love that ran red on the cross that we are justified, that we are forgiven, that we have the joy and the hope of eternal life in you. Don't ever let us forget and chase after the stupid little things of this world. For it is by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God through your blood, Jesus. Amen. Whenever you're ready, come. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where all the love I've ever found comes like a
God, in this season of waiting for a new pastor, for change to come, we just acknowledge our restlessness, God. But that song reminds us that you are for us, that our lives are not our own, and that even in Jesus' name, amen. I want to add one last thought to your communion time. Some of us deal with guilt a lot. Do you know that there is absolutely nothing wrong and there's an awful lot of right? That if you are sitting home feeling overwhelmed with guilt, go to the bread drawer, go to the refrigerator. You don't have to get official communion. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. If you need to be reminded of God's grace in in your own home, turn your eyes on Jesus through this reminder that he gave us. Okay? Okay? We're going to sing one more song right now. Let's stand together as we sing.
I'm enjoying this process of going through some of the heroes and zeros of the Old Testament. And um, next week in particular, we're going to be dealing with a guy named Samson. Um, kind of a fun character in scripture, and so I encourage you to read through more of the book of Judges because what you will discover is Gideon and Samson are not the only interesting judges. Uh, after that, we're going to go into Samuel and some other things like that. But um, for this week, we're going to deal with judge number one, which is Gideon. He's not the first judge, but he's the first one. I'm going to be dealing with. And if you want to find the story of the judges, what book in the Bible do you think you should look at? The book of Judges. It's not rocket science on this one. Right after the book of Joshua, who we dealt with last week, we have Judges because they were very human, kind of like you and me. Judges chapter 1 starting at verse 1. Now, I do want to um, take just a moment for the verse that I encourage you to memorize because Joshua, I'm sorry, Gideon tried to call them to having their hearts given to God. But the thing is, we send our hearts all sorts of other directions. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you because what happened is they kept saying, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king, we want someone to rule us like everybody else has. But God had said, I am your king. So Gideon was trying to keep him focused on that. And the problem is, back in those days, there was the tendency to try to keep up with the Joneses, try to keep up with other people. I realize we don't have that today, where you make decisions based on... And Gideon tried to keep them pure. Because there is always a temptation to worship lesser gods. Like I just talked about with communion. There's always that temptation. So let me read the first few verses of Judges chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who will be the first to go up to fight against the fans? Then the men of Judah said to the Simeonites, their brothers, I'm sorry, go to chapter 6. I don't know what I was thinking. We need to start at chapter 6. We're dealing with Gideon, not the other judges that came before that. Sorry, I thought, why am I reading this? Sorry. Did you ever have one of those mornings? When I got here this morning, it took me three trips over to the office to get the things that I was supposed to have with me in here. And then it took three trips out. Let's try chapter 6 because I think this will really apply to where we're going. All right? <sighs> Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amal um, Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples invaded their country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel. Neither is possible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to them, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live but you have not listened to me. Okay, there's a recurring theme in the book of Judges. And it is a recurring, 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 recurring. You get the picture? Okay, and generally it was about 40 years, sometimes less, sometimes more between them. Here's the, here's the pattern. God blesses Israel, and they repent and say, God, help us. God sends a judge. And by the way, none of the judges were perfect. 
Gideon was pretty good. Some of the others, not so good at all. But he sent them a judge to lead them. Then once again, he blessed Israel. And after every judge, it tells pretty much every time, it tells how long they lived under God's blessing before they forgot him. And then they cried out, and that's the recurring theme. Now, Israel's desperation at the hands of the Midianites, we just read about that. Um, The Midianites, their base of operations was in present-day Yemen, all the way down on the east coast of the Red Sea. And they came up out of that area, came across the Jordan River, came around the bottom of the Dead Sea, and they came up and they tried to take everything. Well, you heard the description. They came in like locusts, and they just ate and took everything. They plundered everything. And after Deborah, who had been one of the judges, Israel had peace for 40 years. You can read about that in Judges chapter 4 and chapter 5. Okay, But the Midianites as well as their um, Amalekites, came in and oppressed Israel. And the prophet said, I delivered you from Egypt, but I gave you all this. I have delivered you repeatedly, but you have not listened. The Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash of the Abizrite, who was a son of Gideon, or where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Okay. We don't know for sure whether this wine press was inside or outside. All we know is it is an area that is kind of out of sight so that it cannot be seen. When I was in Israel, the wine presses we saw were inside. Okay, But this is very possibly an outdoor one. But what happened is he was threshing the wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites because they were taking everything. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. This is verse 12, and he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Okay. Do you ever know what God wants you to do, but you don't really want to do it because it might be hard? Did you ever know what God wanted you to do, but you are afraid of what people are going to think? Gideon's response, verse 13. But Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Basically, pardon me, but if you're with us, where are all those wonders we had when you came out of Egypt? It seems like you've deserted us. But God answers him with something very interesting in verse 14. He says, go in the strength you have. Okay, what strength did Gideon have? None. (laughs) He had pretty much nada, nothing. Go in the strength you have, I am sending you. And Gideon once again says, oh, wait, wait, pardon me, but um, the tribe of Manasseh is nothing special. It's the least of the tribes, and I'm the least of my people. And God says, I'll be with you. And then we get to when I ask, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Okay, let me tell you something about my faith experience. God has not been insulted when I've asked him for signs like Gideon did. As a matter of fact, I've asked God to speak to me through signs many, many times. And sometimes the only sign he gives me is this burning in my heart to read scripture. And when I read scripture, I discover all the signs I need are right here. Because if what I'm asking goes against scripture, all he does is sends me back to scripture. He doesn't give me any miraculous signs. He just says, read it. I already told you the answer to your question. So the first place, to there's a good or a bad or a right or a wrong. I've discovered that God doesn't appear to get offended with me when I ask for signs. 
Now, Gideon did ask for a sign. And um, what happened is down in verses 20 and 22, the angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and place them on this rock and pour over the broth. And Gideon did so with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. The angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And Gideon went, whoa. Oh, sorry, that's not in there. And then the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that this was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar there, called it the Lord is peace. And to this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abbas rites. And then he is given instruction to do what? Has anybody read this to know what he's told to do? Destroy the false gods. Tear them down. They don't belong. Destroy them. And so he does that. And in the morning, people come to his dad and say, hey, we understand your boy tore down those altars. I love what his dad says. Hey, if Baal can't protect himself, what kind of God is he? Let him take care of himself. And that's how... Gideon got the other name, Jerubal. But there's something else that's putting out the fleeces. I want to go to that for just a moment. This is one of the most memorable stories of Gideon because what Gideon did is he said, God, okay, that was a nice sign. That burning up the stuff and the disappearing act, that was really good stuff. But I'm still not sure. That make the fleece wet and the ground dry. Next time it was make the ground wet and the fleece dry. And God did that. And I think God is willing to work with me and with you on things like this because he realizes how simple we are. He is working with us when we are not all that sharp. Go ahead and turn to the person next to you and say, you know what, you're not all that sharp. Go ahead, you can tell them that. They, they might need to hear it sometimes. On the other hand, sometimes... It, Maybe just rubbing it in. But if you ever hear the phrase about someone, well, you know, I'm not sure what to do, so I'm putting out a fleece. That's where it comes from. Okay, Gideon chapter 6, the end of the chapter. So anyhow, we have God's deliverance. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and Asherah and use it as fuel to sacrifice to God. Gideon did it at night because he was afraid. And that's how he got the name Jerubal. The spirit came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet calling Israel the false gods without consequence. That is when boldness came. I want you to get a concept here. When you obey God, God honors obedience. And Gideon's boldness, Gideon's bravery came after obedience. And in the obedience, then is when he had a sense of God's presence, a sense of God's power, and that's when he picked up the trumpet and called and said, come on, let's do something. It did not happen until obedience. And there's a pattern here. Remember that when Joshua was taking them across the Jordan River, when did the waters part? When the priests carrying the ark stepped into the flood water. Not until obedience did they have the authority. In your life, until you obey, you may not have authority. Obey, you may you may be a wimp. You may be a weakling. As long as you say, well, I'm going to do it my way until God takes care of it. God's saying, I will take care of it when you do it my way. Because power comes in obedience. God's deliverance was revealed in protecting him when he destroyed the false gods. God's deliverance came 
when God had revealed through the fleeces that he was there, and when Gideon blew the trumpet, people responded. But here is chapter 7, which is one of the most wonderful parts of the story of Gideon, because there are really several things about Gideon that just blow my mind. When he blew the trumpet and people responded, how many soldiers came out to help with beating the Midianites? 32,000. 32,000. And God said, if you beat them with 32,000, you're going to pat yourselves on the back and you're going to say, we did it. So tell you what. Well, if you read in chapter 7, it says, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and go home. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. They weren't Marines, were they? (laughs) Hey, anybody who's chicken, just go home. Two-thirds left. They were the honest ones, possibly. Take them down to the water, and I will split them there for you, or sift them there for you. Okay. It says those who drink like a dog will stick around. My understanding is that those who scooped up the water and drank this way so that they could still have their eyes up and going are the ones that were the 300 that remained. And when they were down to 300, then God said, now I can work with this group. We get a glimpse into God's power starting in chapter 7, verse 9. Uh, Let me see. Okay, the end of verse 8. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up and go down to the camp, down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servants, could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man. How many is he going to take against this army? 300. Okay. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling his friend a dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp and struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretations, he worshipped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the, uh, dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. 300 divided in three groups of three, they surrounded the camp. And then Gideon said, when I say a sword for the Lord, smash them. Did you ever hear of a Molotov cocktail? That's a bottle with a rag on it. You light the rag. It has gas or some other flammable liquid inside. Israel is that these were basically Molotov cocktails. They were clay jars with a lamp inside and with an oil supply. So that what happened is when Gideon said a sword for the Lord, they said a sword for the Lord and for Gideon, and they blew the trumpets, and they smashed those so that all around this encampment, what they saw was this fierce army with all of these fires and everything coming at them. And as you read the story, what ended up happening is the Midianites and the rest killed each other. And it says that 300 beat 135,000. That's in chapter 8, verse 10. 
So God used Israel, God gave Israel 40 years of peace during the time of Gideon. By the way, have you ever seen a Gideon Bible? Or have you ever seen anything from the Gideons? What's the little logo that they have? It's one of those lamps with the flame inside. It's one of the clay pots that were used by the 300 as they destroyed the Midianites. Of course, did they destroy the Midianites? No, the Midianites destroyed the Midianites because God terrified them. Kind of a cool story, isn't it? This series, I'm talking about the heroes and the zeros of the Old Testament. Now we get to Gideon's zero moment. Because he's been doing just fine. He put out the fleeces and honored God. He obeyed God. He led the people. He got it down to 300. He led them and they they conquered Go to chapter 8, verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us out of the hand of the Midian, out of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Make a good name for a movie someday, the 300, but that's a different story, okay? He said, no, I'm not going to rule you, and my son is not going to... No, we're not going to become a monarchy, because the Lord will rule you. Verse 24, and he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was a custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each man threw a ring from his ornaments, dependents, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. What's an ephod? It's kind of like a vest, okay? They worshiping these. How about worshiping a gold vest? That's not so sharp either, is it? But it became a snare to Gideon and his family. And Israel worshiped the ephod, prostituting itself to something other than God. What is it to prostitute yourself to someone? And your heart belongs to God. You cannot be a double-minded person. Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. You will love one and hate the other. Um, um, Jen McClure sent me a text yesterday. Siri has trouble with some things, all right? So she, I think she used talk to text. So Ezekiel sure didn't look like Ezekiel. So when I did talk to text back to her, it didn't look like Ezekiel either. I made her figure it out. I remember which one. It talks about the danger of being a double-minded person. James chapter 1, it talks about if any, if any of you lacks wisdom but is not going to obey it, you're a double-minded person driven back and forth by the, like the waves of the sea. This issue of being double-minded is the issue of prostituting your heart, prostituting... I realize we think it was pretty ridiculous for the Israelites to worship a vest. Do you know that I've had some people in my acquaintance that if we were honest, they worshipped clothing? And they worshipped their kids and loved their kids more than they have loved God? You see, the people of ancient Israel are no different than us that we give our hearts to something other than being wholehearted for God. And it's God. Bottom line. In spite of Gideon's wonderful statement in 823, I will not rule you, my sons will not rule you, The Lord will rule you. In spite of that wonderful statement, they let the ephod 
rule them. That is trying to rule you. Let's go through a list of things that people have let rule them. Things that make you do something other than what God wants. For some of us, our boss and our job have done that. For some of us, the almighty dollar has done that. For some of us, our pleasures, our joys. For some wants us to be, and then we meet this boy or this girl that is just so cute. I know they're not a believer, but they're really nice. And we end up following into an faith. What is there that might cause us what is threatening to be our zero moment? For Gideon, it was the ephod. And maybe the pride of remembering the battle. Don't let your kids become don't let your kids come between you and God. Don't let your spouse come between you and God. Don't let don't let your horses or your puppy dogs or your kittens or whatever it is. Was Gideon a hero? Yes. A zero moment, I believe, planted seeds for the rest of Israel to forget God, too. You understand that? If your hero Gideon has given his allegiance to the memory of So, why do I mention that? Because parents, you have an incredible influence on whether your kids keep Christ first. Pastor, you have an incredible influence on whether you give the example of putting Christ first. Let's go back to Joshua for a moment. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Gideon. We thank you that he was there and was your man, and even though he was a timid man, even though he was a reluctant warrior, even though he was a reluctant general, he trusted you to do through him. And Lord, he was a man of faith. And by faith, Gideon saved Israel from the Midianites. Let it be said of each of us that by faith we did the same. By faith we lived. By faith we decided. By faith. And yes, Lord, when we're reluctant, if we put out fleeces, then help us to see clearly what your path is. The Lord, more than anything else, help us to have an undivided heart for you. In your name we pray. Amen know the routine. There are the little baskets at the end of the row for your empty communion cups and stuff. Before you get out of this building, however, I want you to kind of take a moment, stayed away because of the fact that they had health risks and various other things. But there are some that have just gotten out of the habit. And it might be a really good thing for you to reach out and say, you know what? I love you and I miss seeing you at Crossroads on Sunday mornings. Then this week, make contact and say, I can't wait to see you. Okay? Because quite frankly, I don't know whose faces and rear ends usually have occupied. Something you can depend on anybody else to do. This is something that is in your hands. So let's be the body, especially this week, okay? Okay?